It's a very difficult thing, I think, to make something as beautifully crafted as that, or to make anything and then have to talk about it. So uh, my heart goes out to these two wonderful people to the left and the right of me. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Brilliant. So I've got about sort of three or four, maybe five questions that I'm going to warm up with and then uh, I'll open it to the floor. And then if you're not very interesting, I'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah, does that feel fair? Brilliant. So, um, here at the Royal Court, the home of new writing, the uh, writer-director relationship is, a is obviously incredibly important because that's the moment where this play that uh, is heartfelt by our playwright and loved by the theatre then starts to have its life. So how did... Talk to us about your relationship and how did how do, how, does, how did the trust grow between you two as it felt like it did? What um, was the key? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of assumptions that Chris. Didn't know, I didn't mean to, yeah. I think I think well this is my third play here at the in this theatre. And um, I think that as a playwright, as you progress you sort of learn more and more about your own work and you learn a bit more about what you sort of need in order to fully express the thing that was in your mind. And I think what I sort of maybe learned was that I need someone really compassionate and creative <laughs> to work with and someone who gives my work a lot of time, basically. And with this project, that's what we were able to do. We met very early on, about nine months before, um, and we just kept meeting and talking about the play. And that, is, that kind of slow way of working maybe doesn't exist that often in theatre um, at the moment. And that felt really good. Um, and uh, Stuart's the designer also. And so this weird thing happened where that doesn't normally happen with a director because the director's process is such that it happens in the room, in the rehearsal room. And so you sort of never know what they're going to do, really. But when they're the designer, they present their design ahead of the uh, production. And so he, you know, Stuart had to make himself vulnerable like any artist and say, these are my ideas, this is my work. And that's actually a beautiful thing because it sort of puts you on an even footing and you've both made yourselves quite vulnerable and said, well, <laughs> this is what I think. And um, it, I found that a very um, strong way to start, I think, yeah. So do you show, yeah. how was it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sounded really good. And he said, oh, a horrible time. And he just lets me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah, I think talking is great, actually. I sort of think, uh, uh, like, theatre is about conversation when it's in front of an audience, and I think that uh, conversation is, like, part of what we do, and I, I think that just that really, really long conversation, uh, yeah. I, I, and apart from anything else, uh, it, it's about getting to know the person that you're working with. Uh, and I think a play that is maybe as uh, uh, personal as this one is, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, it, it felt as important to me to get to know Emma and who Emma was as an artist as it was to get to uh, know the words on the page. Yeah. And so were a lot of those early conversations, uh, were they actually not necessarily specifically about the play, but just about about life or whatever a conversation is because often when we use the word conversation in it here we're talking about talking about the play but it feels like your conversations were something else is that right i'm a bit of a rambler so <laughs> i mean that's we could sort of <laughs> no i think we did talk about the play yeah, yeah i think yeah. that's it slowly, we did actually really slowly and slowly yeah, yeah. I think we get to the end of an hour or an hour and a half and be like, well, that was a page. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I think it was about the play. Yeah. It wasn't about our holidays. Or no? No. That's a show. No. There were no holidays. There were no holidays. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed, is it? Um, and did the, play, did the play develop a lot in that time? Um, or was it as it... No, I think the uh, kind of interior mechanics of the play, like how the audience 
Um, well, this is a director's question, really. I think the play revealed itself yeah. rather than transformed into something else. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I think this is maybe unusual for a new play, but I think that the play I got from Emma uh, at the beginning of this year uh, <coughs> felt like a finished play. Uh, I, I really didn't feel I was being invited to, uh, like, uh, like change the play to make it work. I felt like my job was to make the play work. Uh, and actually there were very, very few uh, revisions to that draft and they happened very, very late on, just before, like the weekend before we went into rehearsal. Yeah. We get a new draft. But the process of writing the play was such that it had quite a few workshops here. So yeah. I'd worked with loads of actors, all of whom I've tried to th thank in the text, because they were really instrumental in the play developing, and I couldn't have written it without <coughs> them. And so it had been through a really long gestation period, and I think by the time Stuart and I met, it was sort of, well, I was done. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that was the play. <laughs> yeah, and right, right, rewriting in rehearsal is very stressful. I think if it can be avoided, I would prefer to avoid it. Really? Yeah. Um, I think unless you change two lines in rehearsal. <laughs> I think I think unless that's what you're going in, unless that's your your intention and that's your process, that can be amazing. But if you if you believe you have a finished play and week two you change your mind, that's very stressful. And did you put extra things in place to make sure that didn't happen to you on this particular occasion? No, I just worked really hard before <laughs> we got there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was really clear. So really important just to go back to that. Um, where did the seeds of this play, if you don't mind, or be as, as vague as you wish, where did you feel like the seed, where did the seeds of this play come from? And forgive me for this horrific metaphor, where did they, how did they germinate into what we've got now? I thought you were going to use like a thread. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, no! <laughs> Sorry, I even practiced that question. Um, well, it started off as a rough cut uh, to do with technology in January 2013. And I was commissioned to work with the director, Carrie Cracknell, and we developed a piece uh, totally different set in America. I mean, it was totally different. But it evolved and became this. Um, but it did start, yeah, somewhere totally different. And then my ideas evolved and I found a sort of another language for what I was trying to express about the world today. And do you, did, did what you were trying to express about the world today change? Was it more just their language changed over since 2013? I, I think the hardest thing, maybe for me anyway, about writing a play is working out what it's about. And I think once you work out what it's about, then the job is to find sort of the most honest way of revealing that feeling. And um, with this play, I really wanted to take the audience on a journey through that feeling. And to sort of, because it felt like quite a big feeling and um, yeah, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, I can't remember what your question was. No, neither can I, but I'm just <laughs> sort of yeah. dreaming the idea of a big feeling. Yeah. Um, you've answered a little bit of this already, so to go back, it's but when you, you've worked in so many different ways as a, as a director and as, as an artist, and I'm sure you've had so many different ways of beginning, beginning ideas. What was your sort of, first approach to this piece and what did it speak to you? Did, what, was it you as the director or you as the designer that was speaking first? I know you know. Uh, well, first of all, I work as a director and a designer, but when I'm doing both on one project, I don't feel it's like two different jobs I'm doing. It's, it's not like oh, I have a conversation as a designer, then I have a conversation as a director. I feel like I'm talking about... Uh, what, what the play is like and what it looks like and how it, uh, how it uh, speaks to an audience, how it is what it is. So I don't, uh, yeah, I, so there's no separation right, right. as to what those things are. Uh, 
Sorry, what was the Yeah, they go back to them. What was your what, what did, <laughs> that was a brilliant answer. So what did um, what were your what did the player first say to you when you spoke we heard about what Emma was trying to that she was trying to um, say something with it? Well the the thing that I was trying to do all the way through uh, the process of directing the play was trying to remember what the feeling was the first time I read it, where it was so completely discombobulating that as, as, as I was re reading scene by scene, uh, as I was going through, I couldn't work out what I was reading. And I thought, actually, rather than try and uh, clarify this play in any way, I want to try and remember what that is, because that is what the audiences Hopefully, I think that's what the audience's experience of it is. Uh, yeah. And, and then also, I think that there, uh, and, and this is in retrospect, I think that there's uh, part of what Emma does as a playwright that uh, isn't on the page. Uh, and it's something that Emma's spoken about and I've spoken about. So actually, the, a lot of the work that we did was trying to work out with Emma what the play was and what the thing was that wasn't on the page. Yeah. Yeah, great. Which, which happened through uh, lots, lots and lots and lots of conversation. Like, uh, and what do you mean by that? Do you talk, I've heard you both talk about that before, that idea of... Uh, Emma creating things as a writer that's not on the page because that isn't necessarily just visual is it it's about what does it mean what does that mean to you if you don't mind me asking mm, yeah well it's because I've had people say you want that it's not on the page and I go oh no <laughs> I've done it wrong and um, I think it's because maybe my understanding of what drama is and what it is to make a play and why sort of bother um, has sort of changes all the time and it feels um, yeah that I can't remember what you asked me about, about that really that, that thing about things not being on the page I'm really yes, sorry if my friend was wrong. I didn't mean no. that as a, as a problem I know, for I me know, I think I, it's I, no, I, do, no. it's I because can maybe the, yeah, yeah, you well, talk and then I'll talk it's because the experience of the play is not the lines. The experience of watching a play is not what people say to each other, for me. It's what it feels like to watch it. And it's what your own emotional and psychological experience is. And so you have to give people room to have that, I think. And so if you say everything, or if you just have people saying things to each other, for me it's never enough. Because I, I want to imagine and to dream and to breathe and to think when I'm watching a play. I don't want uh, drama always. Um, I, I just want to feel something. And yeah, that's it. And, and often if you take the words that are on the page literally, they take you in a different direction than actually what the drama is. I think so, because yeah. I hope that the play is taking into account our cultural context now and sort of how we're living. And so you don't have to say things, everybody just kind of knows. And can, I, yeah. can I ask you a question then, sort of leading on from that? <laughs> is that, is <laughs> that, what, that, that if uh, uh, somebody else wants to do this play and yeah. there is another production of it, mm. then what is the support system? Um, that I go there and go <laughs> <laughs> just talk close. No, I'll write the um, appendix manual. Um, uh, yeah. 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 But for me, it's fascinating because often we talk about things not being on the page as a, uh, as a, uh, for a problem for reasons negative, but like a deficit in storytelling. Yes. But at no point in what we've talked about, or I'm lucky enough to hear you two talk about, or what I've experienced, having been really lucky enough to come through rehearsal room runs and watch bits of this play yeah, develop, yeah. has it been that? It's more been about, I've drawn a really basic triangle uh, on my little page so that I can learn about theatre when I go home. And it really feels like that you're actively creating some sort of chasm for the audience to be part of. Well, I think in ent maybe in entertainment, um, there's a sort of pressure for um, for clarity. <coughs> I feel like people always say it has to be clear, it has to be clear. 
And I don't know if that's what I want. I don't know if I want clarity. I think I want something else. Um, and so I think there's a kind of pressure or a desire to be clear always. But I'm not sure that helps you feel more alive or feel like you understand more what it is to be alive. Um, because I think those things are nebulous and ambiguous. And I th my belief is the audiences want that. Um, but obviously not massive mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> but some people. Um, and that's okay. That's so okay. what's so, so what trying to nail down the meaning of the play and yes. deliver it to the audience? Or in a big speech one at is, the end. Or, one is yeah. offering the play and if there are uh, 10 or however many, 86 interpretations of that play, then... Well, I read about this thing, which I've said before in an interview, so forgive me if anyone read that, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I read about this experiment where <laughs> there were three groups of people. One group of people um, play the piano, one group of people do nothing, one group of people imagine playing the piano, and they measured the new... Uh, brain activity in the people playing the piano and the people imagining playing the piano, and it was the same. So to imagine <laughs> is a uh, biological and um, physical act that changes your actual brain. And, and I thought, oh right, so when an audience member watches a play, if you give them a chance, then they are biologically and physically potentially transformed if you are able to engage their imagination such that new, I don't know, matter uh, is created in the brain. And I found that satisfying. I thought I would like to imagine seeing something and that my brain had changed uh, when you come out. And yeah, so I think I sort of took hold of that idea and took it quite literally and uh, yeah, I, I wanted the audience to imagine. Amazing, giving the ga you give us gaps for us for our brain to flourish within. I wanted to try, yeah. It's really pretty. Do you know what? That feels like a really lovely moment, having just talked about audience understanding and interpretation of the work, just to open out and see if we have any uh, any questions in the audience. Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah, right at the beginning, Stuart, you said uh, this is very personal to Emma. I mean, I, all plays are clearly personal, but is there something that we don't know that is really. <laughs> that you're going to share with the world? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that sometimes. Uh, playwrights write plays about things that are sort of outside themselves actually. I sometimes feel that I'm watching a play that isn't personal to the playwright and uh, yeah I, I sort of feel like sometimes I'm watching a play that is about generic stuff that is in the world that somebody's just sort of like moving about in front of me. Uh, and I suppose what I mean about a play that is personal to Emma is it is about how she uh, feels about the things in the play that I, like on a very basic level, I think it's what happens when technology meets art, that that's what the play's about, is that there is a, uh, a person who is from a, a, a world, her, her being is full of technology and actually that, that's all she hangs on to. Uh, and there are a group of people who are artists, who are actors, and it's sort of about how that sort of uh, comes together. Uh, and that does feel very personal to me. And as I say, uh, some plays that I go and see feel uh, less personal than that. They feel like they're an analysis of a thing that is out in the world rather than trying to be inside something. Yeah. Well, that connects really, feels like it connects really good actually with the thing that Emma was saying about trying to communicate a feeling. Yeah, I think, well, I hope that everything I write, I write is about myself in a way. And I do want to see plays where I feel that the playwright has maybe put themselves on the line or you know, cried or something when they wrote it. 
they didn't just think genius. <laughs> you know, um, there's that story, I don't know if you know it, um, like Water for Chocolate, it's a Mexican story. Anyway, and there's a scene in it where she um, uh, bakes a cake and she cries into the cake. And then when the guests eat the cake, they all cry. And I think there's something of that in the It's gorgeous. Yes, ma'am. I'll come to you next, all right. Okay, thank you. Um, another theme that I really picked up was the kind of work-life balance and how we deal with that. And the solution that's offered in the play seems to be a very short-term, have this however long experience it is, and then carry on with your life. Is that sort of, um, in your view, a commentary of how we do deal with it at the moment? Or is that because you think that there genuinely isn't a solution and we need to work harder to find one? Um, well, I think what I was interested in is the, um, I've said this before other places, so forgive me, but it's, uh, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, they, um, people became very interested in, obviously, mechanisation machines and the quantifiable and measurable. And, you know, there's this guy who I read, uh, Lewis Mumford, and he writes about ideas like imagination, sort of the subjective imagination, um, dreams, uh, what else is it? Intuition um, becoming less important, and uh, anything measurable, time, uh, energy, uh, money, becoming more important. And I suppose I feel that there isn't a lot of space, maybe, for um, intuition, for example, in our society, um, which often is quite strongly. Those ideas are more thought of as sort of female attributes, possibly. Um, and uh, I remember when I came off Facebook, um, which I did after researching this play actually, because I got really freaked out and paranoid at one point because I met loads of tech people. And um, I came off Twitter and Facebook. And I suddenly had this feeling that I had when I was younger, when you used to call people on the landline and stuff. And um, it was an intuition about a friend. and. I rang her and I said, oh, how are you? And something terrible had happened. And she said, oh, it's really strange that you should call me because um, I had just posted pictures of my like amazing holiday on Facebook. And so everyone thinks I'm fine. But obviously something in me thought, well, she's not, or I haven't heard from her, and so mm -hmm. I called her. And, and I thought, oh, that's an old feeling. And yeah, it was nice to feel it. And so it, there's some stuff like that, I suppose. It doesn't really answer your work-life balance thing. Um, but it's about maybe what we value and about how um, one or art maybe in some way can protect people against complete abandonment of those things. Maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Um, given your personal connection to this work and your theory about that feeling of, <laughs> yeah. sorry, I don't get um, that feeling of um, your personal identity being really um, involved within what you write. Do you feel <coughs> that now that you have seen this work performed, that that personal connection has been broken? Um, or do you feel that it's been strengthened because it's now out in the world for other people to see? Um, I think with this play, I think I feel it's been strengthened. I think sometimes plays sort of, I don't know, feel brutal in some way and in some t sometimes they feel sort of nourishing or something and I felt um, maybe because of the process of making the play that it was quite an enriching and slow and considered process uh, <coughs> where I felt very able to speak and to um, contribute and I think that left me feeling quite free and like maybe I hadn't just made a play to go on at the Royal Court that'll be over in three weeks, but maybe I'd done the nebulous sort of desirable thing that you don't know what the impact is, but it's created a little ripple and that's enough, yeah. Sorry. Sure, I, just, I was thinking about that idea there about, um, about you, the, the, the personal feeling being broken once the piece has been performed and created. As a, as a director here with specific of a piece of new writing, has your personal feeling as, a, as an artist of expression, uh, have you, do you feel like it's ch your, your 
sense of yeah, your sense of expression has changed as the piece has been in, in its run. Uh, has it? As in, do, you, uh, do you know something I found really sort of enjoyable tonight? Actually, was I haven't seen the play for about two and a half weeks, and I sort of felt that I was distanced enough from it that I could watch it like it was a play. And actually, I yeah, I sort of got excited about that. I sort of because <laughs> uh, you know when you're working on a play, you know, you watch the play like. You know, the end of the rehearsal room to the first performance, you you probably watch it like, what, 10, 12, 14 times? Uh, and yeah, yeah, you do get a bit sort of... Uh, yeah, I, I think you can lose perspective on it. And I found it really enjoyable tonight to sort of come back and sort of see this thing that actually has a life of its own now, that is sort of... Uh, there and doing stuff that you didn't tell it to do, but is sort <laughs> of just doing what it does, and I find that quite exciting. Yeah. Hello, Jackie. Yeah, it's more like an uh, observation rather than a question. But um, I just wonder. I, I find watching the play like a really profoundly political experience, actually, because. Um, it, obviously you're going to make work in the context of the world that you're inhabiting and you can't dissociate yourself from those two things but there's something for me around the possibility that we're living in now a perpetual state where the, our understanding of what truth is and what untruth is and our perpetual demand for um, experiences beyond the known and, and our sort of inability to really comprehend what our reality is and, 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 and the desire for something other than that might be this sort of life that we now live. Um, and actually the last time I was here in the Royal Course, to admit that was a while ago, was to see X downstairs, which actually was like really big echoes for me around how that might also relate to women and, and memory and longing and loss. and. Um, I just wonder what you both feel about whether or not the act of trying to demonstrate that as a communal act, like our loss of reality, might be a politic, might be a new form of political theatre. Like I'm just comparing, like I'm comparing it to something like In Your Face, which was to me the opposite experience tonight, where you said I have an opportunity to, I want the audience to feel something, and I, and I felt <coughs> so much of my own experience of. The world reflected back onto me, and do you, I, I just wonder where you see that going. Do you think that is like a current trend? That, and I know from Stuart's work, he often plays with the gap between reality and fiction. Maybe that's just the world that we're in now. Yeah, it feel, well, if I think going to the theatre is a political act, um, I think it's an assertion of risk, or going to see a new play anyway. It's saying I'm going to pay money to not know, and I'm going to pay money to trust that someone has really, really thought about this, and that they've thought about it for maybe three years, maybe longer, and that they really believe in it, I hope, and I'm, I'm going to pay money to experience that risk, and I think there are so few opportunities to do that and to trust sort of um, people who've just imagined something. And I, so I think going to the theatre is a political act and it's an exercise of imagination or um, freedom of the brain or something. And so I think maybe when I write a play or when I wrote this play, I wanted to take that into account, to take into account that, they, that people had come and that they had brought their um, minds and that that's allowed, you know, that they don't necessarily just want to be told a story really fast. Um, that it's, um, that their, their minds are allowed and they're valuable to me. And so, yeah, I, I think that that is political. Uh. But, but the, also the thing of whether things are real or not, I just, like tonight I got a real buzz when the character Maggie said, 
uh, I'm not an actress. And there's just so many levels of reality <laughs> you can sort of uh, like reflect on that. And I sort of found that really enjoyable actually, that somebody standing on a stage uh, in front of you says, I'm not an actor. Uh, and, and it's telling the truth. I sort of find that uh, pretty enjoyable. It just echoed within like the costume changes and stuff happening at the side and the house like flicking on and off. I, I just I so enjoyed being messed with a little bit around what my complicity is in trying to work out what what the levels of positivity and truth were. It's really yeah. satisfying. I've got time for one more question, yes sir. Uh, it's a kind of observation about how the play evolves. So for the most part it's very time linear. But there are points at which you have scenes, you know, lights go off, you, and it repeats, but with obviously different different words, and people being given different words. <coughs> and I wonder why why did you do that, Emma? Um, what were you thinking when you sort of wrote in these repeat scenes within an overriding sort of time linear structure? Um, well. They are time linear. Yeah, I don't want to get technical. But, um, they are still time linear. I suppose what what's happening in the gaps is that they are um, sort of building on what they've done, um, like they've always been doing in the ellipses. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I can yeah. have a stab at yeah, that? Yeah, that's a director's question. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I sort of think that uh, that those that the scenes that are repeated are not Emma repeating something. They're, because I think that uh, actually most of the play is Emma imagining actors improvising. And I think that the scene where it happens three times is that it's a group of actors trying to make a scene happen and they get to a certain point and the lights go out and she's edited out the actors going to each other should we have another go at that and actually if you take that line and I take that line maybe we can make it work so it actually like within the world of the play it it absolutely is time linear I don't know if that helps or confuses does that make sense yeah, I mean, kind of. I mean, when, when you think about obviously what's going on, the actual obviously it, it's clarified later. It, it kind of makes sense. But at the same time, what you're doing by doing that, the sort of imagination in those blackouts that they're going, right, that didn't quite work. Let's do that again. Like so, on, do it. That kind of also breaks down what they're trying to achieve by creating this setup for for Maggie. So it's kind of a weird. I think the idea of the reveal is that you hopefully um, at the end feel that you always knew everything you needed to know. It's just that you sort of didn't see it. Rather than, even though you are told more information at the end, but really you had enough to go on. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can't thank you all enough for spending your time with us now. Uh, Emma Crow and Stuart Lang, thank you.